Forward of Armageddon 2419 AD. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Megan Argo. Armageddon 2419 AD by Philip Francis Nolan. Forward. Elsewhere I have set down, for whatever interest they have in this, the twenty-fifth century, my personal recollections of the twentieth century. Now it occurs to me that my memoirs of the twenty-fifth century may have an equal interest five hundred years from now, particularly in view of that unique perspective from which I have seen the twenty-fifth century, entering it as I did in one leap across a gap of four hundred and ninety-two years. This statement requires elucidation. There are still many in the world who are not familiar with my unique experience. Five centuries from now there may be many more, especially if civilization is fated to endure any worse convulsions than those which have occurred between 1975 AD and the present time. I should state, therefore, that I, Anthony Rogers, am, so far as I know, the only man alive whose normal span of 81 years of life has been spread over a period of 573 years. To be precise, I lived the first 29 years of my life between 1898 and 1927, the other fifty-two since 2419. The gap between these two, a period of nearly five hundred years, I spent in a state of suspended animation, free from the ravages of catabolic processes, and without any apparent effect on my physical or mental faculties. When I began my long sleep, man had just begun his real conquest of the air in a sudden series of transoceanic flights in airplanes driven by internal combustion motors. He had barely begun to speculate on the possibilities of harnessing subatomic forces, and had made no further practical penetration into the field of ethereal pulsations than the primitive radio and television of that day. The United States of America was the most powerful nation in the world, its political, financial, industrial and scientific influence being supreme, and in the arts also it was rapidly climbing into leadership. I awoke to find the America I knew a total wreck to find Americans a hunted race in their own land, hiding in the dense forests that covered the shattered and levelled ruins of their once magnificent cities, desperately preserving and struggling to develop in their secret retreats the remnants of their culture and science, and the undying flame of their sturdy independence. World domination was in the hands of Mongolians, and the centre of world power lay in inland China, with Americans one of the few races of mankind unsubdued, and it must be admitted, in fairness to the truth, not worth the trouble of subduing in the eyes of the Han air lords who ruled North America as titular tributaries of the most magnificent. For they needed not the forests in which the Americans lived, nor the resources of the vast territories these forests covered. With the perfection to which they had reduced the synthetic production of necessities and luxuries, their remarkable development of scientific processes and mechanical accomplishment of work, they had no economic need for the forests, and no economic desire for the enslaved labour of an unruly race. They had all they needed for their magnificently luxurious and degraded scheme of civilization within the walls of the fifteen cities of sparkling glass they had flung skyward on the sites of ancient American centres, into the bowels of the earth underneath them, and with relatively small surrounding areas of agriculture. Complete domination of the air rendered communication between these centres a matter of ease and safety. Occasional destructive raids on the wastelands were considered all that was necessary to keep the wild Americans on the run within the shelter of their forests, and prevent their becoming a menace to the hand civilization. But nearly three hundred years of easily maintained security, the last century of which had been nearly sterile in scientific, social and economic progress, had softened and devitalised the hands. It had likewise developed, beneath the protecting foliage of the forest, the growth of a vigorous new American civilization, remarkable in the motility and flexibility of its organization, in its conquest of almost insuperable obstacles, in the development and guarding of its industrial and scientific resources, all in anticipation of that day of hope to which it had been looking forward for generations, when it would be strong enough to burst from the green chrysalis of the forests, soar into the upper air lanes and destroy the yellow incubus. At the time I awoke, the day of hope was almost at hand. I shall not attempt to set forth a detailed history of the Second War of Independence, for that has been recorded already by better historians than I am. 
Instead, I shall confine myself largely to the part I was fortunate enough to play in this struggle, and in the events leading up to it. It all resulted from my interest in radioactive gases. During the latter part of 1927, my company, the American Radioactive Gas Corporation, had been keeping me busy investigating reports of unusual phenomena observed in certain abandoned coal mines near the Wyoming Valley in Pennsylvania. With two assistants and a complete equipment of scientific instruments, I began the exploration of a deserted working in a mountainous district, where, several weeks before, a number of mining engineers had reported trace of carnotite, a hydrovanidate of uranium and other metals, used as a source of radium compounds, and what they believed to be radioactive gases. Their report was not without foundation, it was apparent from the outset, for in our examination of the upper levels of the mine, our instruments indicated a vigorous radioactivity. On the morning of December 15th, we descended to one of the lowest levels. To our surprise, we found no water there. Obviously, it had been drained off through some break in the strata. We noticed, too, that the rock in the side walls of the shaft was soft, evidently due to the radioactivity, and pieces crumbled underfoot rather easily. We made our way cautiously down the shaft, when, suddenly, the rotted timbers above us gave way. I jumped ahead, barely escaping the avalanche of coal and soft rock. But my companions, who were several paces behind me, were buried under it, and undoubtedly met instant death. I was trapped. Return was impossible. With my electric torch I explored the shaft to its end, but could find no other way out. The air became increasingly difficult to breathe, probably from the rapid accumulation of the radioactive gases. In a little while my senses reeled, and I lost consciousness. When I awoke there was a cool and refreshing circulation of air in the shaft. I had no thought that I had been unconscious for more than a few hours, although it seems that the radioactive gas kept me in a state of suspended animation for something like five hundred years. My awakening, I figured out later, had been due to some shifting of the strata, which reopened the shaft and cleared the atmosphere in the working. This must have been the case, for I was able to struggle back up the shaft, over a pile of debris, and stagger up the long incline to the mouth of the mine, where an entirely different world, overgrown with a vast forest and no visible sign of human habitation, met my eyes. I shall pass over the days of mental agony that followed in my attempt to grasp the meaning of it all. There were times when I felt that I was on the verge of insanity. I roamed the unfamiliar forest like a lost soul. Had it not been for the necessity of improvising traps and crude clubs with which to slay my food, I believe I should have gone mad. Suffice it to say, however, that I survived this psychic crisis. I shall begin my narrative proper with my first contact with Americans of the year 2419 AD. End of foreword.